Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good again to see everybody back. This is program number four this afternoon, and uh, I don't know, is that table full of goodies about gone, Mom? No? <laughs> Anyway, those of you visiting from out of town, why uh, we just love to have you come in for an afternoon. And uh, Channel 47 is real easy to find, and all you have to do is stop someplace and ask where it's at, and it's uh, just real easy to get to. So we'd love to have you come in anytime. Okay, we're uh, working on book number 71. What is this, the middle three, four? The middle four or the last four? The middle four, okay and uh, book 71, and we're uh, kind of jumping around a little bit today. I uh, didn't feel comfortable in just staying with Joel, all four programs, so I think it's probably working out the way the Lord wants it. So we ended up in our last half hour on the revelation of the things that have been kept secret, and uh, hopefully uh, everyone remembers what we're talking about now that God in His sovereignty can keep things secret until He is ready to reveal it. And uh, we saw some examples coming up through Scripture. But now when we get to the Apostle Paul, who was sent to the Gentiles specifically, whereas the twelve were apostles of Israel, we find that his message, his gospel, is a revelation of everything that had been kept secret from Adam on until we get to this apostle. And so we're going to look at this last half hour program on Paul's gospel. Because, beloved, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. That's what we've got on the board. But why I emphasize Paul's gospel is because Romans 2.16 says it so plainly and so simply where he writes that every man will be judged by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. In other words, lost people are going to come up before the great white throne and Christ will tell them up front, well, you're here because you refuse to believe Paul's gospel. And uh, always remember, we're dealing with more people on the planet right now than have probably lived almost from day one. So that puts most of humanity under the requirement then to believe Paul's gospel. All right, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, let's just start at verse 1. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. Now the first two chapters are dealing with Paul's gospel. How that the unsaved person is brought into a relationship with Jesus Christ by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection. All right, so now verse 1. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you, what? Gentile. Now, that's not there just to fill space. That's what he was. He was the apostle of the Gentiles, whereas Peter and the eleven were apostles of Israel. Two totally different programs, as different as daylight from dark. The twelve were associated with temple worship, the law, the Old Testament promises, the nation of Israel. But Israel rejected everything. So now God's going to do something totally different. In fact, now, this is the way I teach. I can't help it. Keep your hand in Ephesians. Come back with me to Matthew chapter 10. Now, for a lot of you, you're going to say, oh, yeah, we've seen this over and over and over. But for others, they've never seen it before at all. Because you won't find this in Sunday school quarterlies. You won't find preachers preaching on it because they just can't handle it. But here it is on black and white. Matthew 10, verse 5. The beginning of his earthly ministry, he has just chosen the twelve apostles, or the disciples. Now verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, 
go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans who were half-breed Jews, enter you not, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And what's he say? Have nothing to do with anybody who is not a Jew, the house of Israel. And so it was throughout his three years, with two exceptions. He had nothing to do with Gentiles. And the 12 had nothing to do with Gentiles because that was all based on the Old Testament promises. And the Old Testament promises had nothing to do with anybody but Israel. And then once Israel comes into that place of privilege, yes, then Israel could evangelize the rest of the world. But Israel rejected everything. And now they show their rejection now in Acts chapter 7. Come up with me there when they stoned Stephen. This is the, the crescendo, is the word I always use, the crescendo of their rejection. We'll not have this Jesus of Nazareth under any circumstances. Now remember, Stephen is appealing to them after the fact. He's been crucified. He's been raised from the dead. He's gone back to glory. But he will yet return and bring in the kingdom if Israel would just repent of having killed him and believe who he was. But they will not. All right, and here's their response. Verse 57 of Acts 7. And Stephen has been appealing to believe who he was. All right? So verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears. They ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. Well, now you've always heard the old cliche I've used over and over through the years. If you don't like the message, kill the messenger. Well, that's what Israel had been doing for centuries. If they didn't like what the prophets wrote and preached, they'd kill them. All right, same way here. They didn't like what Stephen was preaching, so they killed him. All right, then... Verse 59, uh, verse 58. They cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now what's that? That's a new character. A new player on the stage of biblical history. Saul of Tarsus. First time he's mentioned. All right. Then, of course, you go over into chapter 9, and he's now like a raging bull going up to Damascus to arrest Jews who had embraced Jesus as the Messiah, and he's going to continue his persecution of those people, put them to death, put them in prison, whatever. But, oh, God intervened. God intervened supernaturally. Save that raging bull. Melted him like hot butter on a July afternoon to where he said what? Lord, what would you have me to do? All right, now let's just jump over a few verses in Acts chapter 9 to verse 15. And here is the big fork in the road, beloved. And Christendom can't see it. Here Jesus has told the twelve, go to no one but Jews. The Jews have rejected it. Now here comes the other fork in the road. And the Lord said unto Ananias, Go thy way, for he, Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. Just the opposite of what he told the twelve. Now why can't people see that? Here the Lord from heaven tells another Jew this man is going to go to the Gentiles. And what's going to be his message to the Gentiles? The same thing that Peter and the eleven had preached? No. A whole new revelation. A whole new ball game, if I can use present day vernacular. Everything is going to be different. The same God. The same Christ. But all a whole different program. 
All right, now then let's go back to the verse that we started out with and I didn't get to uh, read. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. Now this apostle, having been commissioned by the Lord himself, back there in Acts chapter 9, can now let us know what has happened. God has opened up the secrets. He has quit holding them. And he just opens them up and pours them on this apostle so that he, in turn, can take it out to the Gentile world. Now, when people rebel at that, and you've heard me say it before in the program, do they rebel at the fact that God used Moses the same way? No, they have any problem with that. But that's what God did. The whole first five books of Genesis are written by Moses. Everything pertaining to the nation of Israel and the law and the tabernacle and the priesthood came through Moses. Well, they don't bother with that. But then when you tell him that God doing the same thing for the Gentiles with another man, the Apostle Paul, they can't handle it. But hey, that's where it's at. Okay, Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you. Now, if Moses would be writing, what would Moses say? I'm bringing you the dispensation of law, which God gave to me, and I'm coming down the mountain, and I'm giving it to you. Only the you was Israel, but with Paul, the you is the whole human race, but predominantly the Gentile. All right, so to this man was given all the directions for this dispensation of grace. Now, I'm going to, again, define a dispensation like I've done it many, many times on this program. What is a dispensation? Well, it's a period of time during which God deals with a segment of the human race in a particular way. He gives them particular directions. And I like to use the prescription aspect. That if a doctor writes a prescription and you take it to the pharmacist, he fills the prescription, he puts in the bottle what the doctor has ordered for your particular need, but what's on the outside? Directions. And that's the key part. What good does it do to have a medication if you don't know how much or how little to take? What good does it do to have a, 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 a bottle of, of medicine for a chest cold when over here you got a bottle of medicine for arthritis? Now just stop and think a minute. Now I'm going to keep the medications fluid only for sake of my illustration. Here you've got a bottle of medicine that has been given for your arthritic joint pains or whatever. It's got its own set of directions. But now you've gone in and you've gotten a bottle of medicine for a chest cold. It too has its own set of directions. Now who in the world would even think about taking the cap off of both of them and mix them and then take a little bit of both of them or a little of one and more of another? Was that the way you would handle a prescription? No, but that's what they're doing with this one. Now give me the first and simplest dispensation was Adam and Eve in the garden. God had them under a set of circumstances for a particular period of time, and he gave them a set of directions. But it was the simplest of all the dispensations because their directions only included one thing, and what was it? Of that tree you shall not eat. Everything else, there was no problem. There was no death. There was no sickness. There was no sin, there was no temptation, there was no tempter. Everything is yours to enjoy, but do not eat of that tree. That was their directions. Now, when they did not follow directions, what happened? They got in trouble. And they fell. And the result of their fall was expulsion from the garden. Now we come all the way up through biblical history with these various times that God gave a set of directions. And when they failed him, he moved on to a different one. All right, now we come to our particular 
dispensation and the set of directions is believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. What gospel? Paul's gospel. And what's it based on? That finished work of the cross. All right. Time's running. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's move on. So this dispensation, this set of directions for us today was given to no one but the Apostle Paul. That's why Peter and the other 11 did not have an understanding of it until finally at the end of Peter's life as he's writing his second epistle, what does he tell his Jewish readers? Now with the temple going to be destroyed in a year or two, God inspires the apostle Peter to write to his Jewish people, if you want salvation, you go to Paul's epistles. Why didn't he tell his Jewish readers, go to John? Remember what Jesus said. But he doesn't. He says, you go to Paul's epistles. Because that's where it's at for this dispensation. All right, read on. Verse 3. How that by revelation of revealing, he made known unto me the mystery or the secret of this gospel of the grace of God. Now stop and think a minute. Why is this so different from everything that went before. Well, you see, everything since Moses was resting on the law, temple worship, the sacrifices, the priesthood, that's all they knew. And then to have this man come along and say, that all counts for nothing, forget it. All you do now is believe in that finished work of the cross. You see the difference? All the difference in the world. We're not under temple worship. We're not under a set of rules and regulations. We're resting on what Christ has done on our behalf. He's done it all. And we don't have to do a thing but believe it and rest in it. Okay, so this is what he's driving at, see? That it all came by a revelation. Now verse 4. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery or the secrets of Christ. My, there is so much that comes out in Paul's epistles that was never even hinted at in Scripture before. Why? Because it's a revelation of things that have been kept secret. Next verse, verse 5. Which in other ages or generations, or dispensations, in other words, all the way back to Adam, was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. Now, you've got to be careful there. We're not talking about the twelve. We're talking about the men who worked and, and served along with this apostle. I'm thinking of Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and Titus and so forth. They understood the twelve didn't. All right, now go on. Verse 6, that the Gentiles. Now you see, that was the hardest pill of all for a Jew to swallow, that God would have anything to do with those pagan Gentiles. But here it is, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ. How? By the gospel. Well, now here I guess I better stop. And let's define the gospel according to Scripture. Not according to any denomination, not according to tracts, not according to me. What's the gospel according to Scripture? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And as I've said before, I say it again. Why does most of Christendom totally ignore it? Now, just the other day, I got something in the mail, and uh, I'm not going to define it too closely, but in the opening page was a whole page of how to become a Christian. Remember, honey? And I said, honey, read this. And it was good, with one exception, not one reference to the resurrection. 
Not a word. How can they do that? Because, listen, if it weren't for the resurrection, that death on the cross would have gone for nothing. But it took the power of his resurrection to make that work of the cross worthwhile, to make it operate, to give it energy. All right, here it is. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the one and only which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. Now, can you make it any plainer than that? This is the gospel that saves people. Nothing else. And here it is. Reading on in verse 2, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest you believed in vain, and it would count for nothing. Now verse 3. For I delivered unto you, not Jesus, not John, not Peter, Paul, delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, and we saw from Galatians in the last half hour, where did he receive it? From the ascended Lord. That's where he got it, not from any of the others. That's what he said, it didn't come after man but it came directly from Christ himself. How that, now here's the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. But you see, it was an unknown entity until God revealed it to this apostle. And that's why I have to keep trumpeting it and trumpeting it and trumpeting it. If you don't follow Paul's and his writings, you're doomed. Because that's where it's at. God does not wink at half-truths. God is not some Santa Claus who can be manipulated. He's absolute. And we've got to be aware of that. My, I was just talking to a young man here today who agrees with me. He says, you can talk to people up and down the streets of even Tulsa, Oklahoma, and ask them how do they think they're going to get to heaven. And the answer is almost universal. I'm doing the best I can. I think God will accept me. No, he won't, because no person can do enough good works to merit God's favor. We have to believe what he has done. All right, so here's the gospel. And uh, now if you'll come back with me once again to Ephesians 3, and then we're going to move on to a few other places where it's by this gospel plus nothing that we have salvation. All right, back to Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 6 again, that the Gentiles should by... Um, my gospel, or let me read it again, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel whereof I, not we, I, was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me. See, now the man isn't proud. He's not puffed up. If anything, he's the opposite. He's the humblest of the humble. And look what he says. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. He's at the bottom of the heap. Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see, not just Israel, not just the Gentiles, but the whole human race now comes under this gospel of grace to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery or these things kept secret, which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God. See that? What does that mean? It was kept secret in the mind of God, never revealed it until this apostle. And these things were hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. All right, we only got a couple minutes left. Let's come back quickly now and see how that this gospel and this gospel alone is what saves us to the uttermost. Romans chapter 1.
And we're going to make a quick run through a few scriptures, so be ready to turn the pages. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And what's the gospel? That he died, was buried, and rose from the dead. That's the gospel. All right? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation, eternal life, to everyone that believes and is baptized. No, it doesn't say that. To everyone who believes and gives 10%. No, it doesn't say that. To everyone who believes and joins the church. It doesn't say that. And on and on we could go. But it's to everyone that what? Believeth. What's the other word for believe? Faith. Faith plus nothing. Here it is. There's nothing else added to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile. All right, come over to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Verse 23, all have sinned. Every human being is without God in his life until he's saved. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption, as we saw in previous programs, through the process of buying us back that is in Christ Jesus. Now drop down to verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and he might be the justifier of him or that person who, what? Believeth. Now turn quickly to chapter 5, and then it's going to be over. Time is gone. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith. In what? The gospel. Believe with all your heart that when Christ died, he died for you. He died for me. He died for the whole human race. That's the gospel. All right? And so being justified by faith, now we have what? Peace with God. Why? Because now we're one of his own. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries. 